Let's look at family relationships from a number of different perspectives and time periods. Um, when I was uh, kind of cresting into the teenage years, uh, the first thing that you know really grated on me was the hypocrisy, mostly noticeable in environmental aspects. My parents would go to lectures on environmentalism and then they would say they don't uh, want to spend the time composting food so let's just throw it out in the garbage and recycling is too much trouble and uh, hanging the clothes out on the washing machine rather than drying them again too much trouble and so there's just too many of these things that seemed hypocritical and uh, part of me was quite hurt and upset by that hypocrisy um, and so there was a certain amount of a fight, um, which when that got to be too much for my mother, they just shifted me out of the house and out to a, uh, a boarding school. And so in that sense, um, you know, there was a certain uneasy dynamic in the fight and in the fact of not having legal control. Um, a little bit later, as you know, strong emotions started leading to reactivity um, in a dynamic in which the more emotional I became, the more my father would use his articulating talent to humiliate me. Uh, I realized that it was very difficult to break out of reactivity as a teenager living in the power structure of parents that caused high amounts of pain. And the, the best approach seemed to be able to dissociate. And so I did a mental exercise in my teens that basically said, you know, and I think by teens I mean 14, 15, that I, I looked at at a very detailed analysis of my parents' behavior and the other adults that I was aware of or had read about. And I concluded that I would not hate or be reactive to my parents if I met them on the street. I wouldn't particularly like them, but I wouldn't be reactive if I was to meet them as as strangers. I might enjoy a conversation with my father. Um, I might or might not, you know, enjoy a conversation with my mother. But um, it seemed like the, 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 the crux in the reactivity was coming from the place that I was looking at them as parents in relationship to the parents I wanted them to be or wanted to have. And this was in the midst of, you know, a severe amount of pain, a very wide gap between the parents I wanted and the parents that I had, and uh, a powerless dynamic legally and financially to create a high level of reactivity. Um, and since the reactivity was then used against me in a shaming, humiliating dynamic that increased the reactivity, which was then used in a shaming and humiliating dynamic um, with little empathy uh, for the child, as is the case with uh, inexperienced and narcissistic parents. Uh, then the, the question was, how could I break the cycle? And uh, the first step that I did was to call them by their names, Michael and Sherilyn. And I, and I used those names intentionally to remind me of who they were on the street. They might be horrible disappointments as parents, but they were no worse than anyone else that I was likely to meet. Uh, and so by calling them Michael and Sherilyn, what I was affirming in my own mind is that these are people um, who I happen to be engaging with 
um, but they're not really my parents. I, I wouldn't choose them. I don't look up to them as parents. Um, and, you know, they have their flaws and their ups and their downs, and um, so does everyone else. And, and so that mental detachment was one step of breaking that escalating abuse cycle where I become reactive and then uh, become humiliated and then become reactive and then become humiliated, feeling powerless in that dynamic. Um, and the second thing that I did was to withdraw. Now, uh, as the eldest brother and the eldest child, um, I realized that the withdrawal had to take two forms. I realized that there were ways that I was uh, participating in, in the family culture of violation. Uh, for example, people would come into my room and take things or break things or steal things and, uh, and then maybe lie about it. And then I would go into their room and take things and use them, etc in kind of, well, you're doing it to me, so I'll do it to you, and we're all doing this. And I realized that uh, if I wanted a really clean break with a, with a consistent boundary uh, where I wasn't going to be violated, I needed to stop doing all of that. And this is very difficult in a promiscuous household uh, where there's very little structure and boundary and integrity around this kind of thing, and there's kind of a torment mentality of, uh, you know, Michael is tormenting Sherilyn, Sherilyn's tormenting Michael. When they burst out, they torment the children. They try and incite the children to torment each other. Um, when they're bored, they poke at whoever has strong feelings to try and upset them, just so they're not so bored and frustrated. Um, and it's, it's very difficult to have anything to do with a dynamic like that and not get sucked in. Because if you care about yourself or any other person in that cycle, then that care is, is being violated by the torment. And I decided that the cleanest way was to have nothing to do with the family. And so this meant taking, you know, cutting off the giving and the receiving, the borrowing and the lending, the, the stealing and being stolen from. This, this needed to be a kind of a clean break. And so um, what I told my parents and the siblings uh, is I will not go in your room without permission. And I was the only one uh, kind of, putting forth any kind of a, a respect structure. So, you know, my parents would just barge into my siblings' rooms or my siblings would barge into each other's rooms. So I started to knock and I won't go in unless you invite me and if I needed to have some interaction. But for the most part, I said, you know, knock and, uh, you know, we'll talk, but I do not want to have engagement in the family. I don't want to go on family outings. I will cook my own food. I will do my own laundry. Uh, and I will take care of my room. And I will have no family participation. And what this basically gave me was a level of attachment that as my father used his, his, his favorite tormenting tool, which was to uh, reframe things that were going on in the worst possible way uh, deliberately to upset people. And so if you were there you, and you cared about truth and integrity and stuff, this was bound to be a reactive point, which he would then use that reactivity as his, as his lever to get you off balance. And then he'd try and chase you to fall into as many embarrassing positions as possible uh, before uh, pretending that it was all too much for him and, you know, he was the only sane one in the family and so he would leave, you know, the, the thing in ruins. 
Now this is a complete joke to look at objectively. Uh, you know, it's just a, a, a child in an adult's body who's very frustrated and angry and wants to hurt people and uh, doesn't have the guts or the vulnerability to deal with that if, if, if he has the skill. Um, and who partly hates himself and then hates everyone else and goes back and forth and, you know, is just venting that frustration. So in that, in that system, the kindest thing is just to be out of it um, and to be aware of it. So I did writing and stuff to, to note the different dynamics. Um, and one of the things that also, um, I guess, is, is a mental companion to this equanimity in uh, the face of tremendous amount of pain is that I always expect people to continue behaving how they have behaved unless a force equal or greater uh, encounters them and, and leads to a change. And with my parents being the dominant force in the household, there was absolutely no reason to expect that they would change in any way whatsoever. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, Sherilyn would continue to be inadequate to meet my father's needs for love. Uh, he would continue to pout and tantrum and punish her. Uh, she would continue to, to behave like a child and try and do, do whatever to avoid his punishment and get flustered and have fits and and uh, then they would use the children as part of their battle to try and get the child to say something to the other one that would upset them um, and, and then enjoy that upset uh, as their only satisfaction. And, and so why would that stop with them being the power structures in the house? Why would the hypocrisy stop? Uh, why would any of that stop? And so... Um, so I, I simply expected that that would continue. Um, and so if there was any surprise about that, like, well, why would, why would you be surprised about that? You, you're clearly in this relationship dynamic around this and that. And, but even making these comments, I, I realized lost me my centered position. And so um, I made note of it and stayed silent and didn't take sides. Um, you know, so if someone would run to me in the family and say, oh, so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so has done this and this and this. i just note it. And then the other one might run. And so without getting, putting energy into the system, the other paradigm was that this is a sick system. And the more energy that is put into this system, the more energy will be caught up in a sick dynamic. The more I extract energy, the more I can funnel it somewhere, you know, somewhere else. Um, and so isolating myself in my room was part of that. Um, leaving school and doing homeschooling was in part to extract myself from the family transportation debacle. Um, which, you know, there's, there's the, the frustration and helplessness of your parents making you late for school. There's the irritation of fighting and arguing in the back seat. There's the, the, the irritation of listening to the parent blame the children. Um, the, the whole thing is, is just kind of a tragic embarrassment to be a part of. And so by doing my own homeschooling program, being able to just not, I don't have to engage. Uh, I learned to cook, did laundry, kept my room clean and neat and organized, put a lock on the door. And the other kind of dynamic, because my parents were disturbed by the fact that I was putting up a, a barrier. And so, um, they, they tried to poke at it in various ways. Um, and so the, you know, one was to invade my room, thus the lock. Um, you know, another was to try and draw me out. 
Um, and what they wanted to do was ask kind of leading questions that would get an emotional opening so that, you know, they could get it. And I'm talking more about my father here. So they could get a hook into that. Um, and my response to that was to uh, take a transactional approach. Um, so if my father did come to the room, uh, I would ask him what he wanted um, and why he wanted it. And that kind of put, a, put an end to, to him coming to my room for the most part because uh, he couldn't very well say, well, I'm bored and I'm just going to try and see if I can get a rise out of you emotionally. Um, and yet that's really what he wanted. And so that kind of put an end to that. Um, and the, the, the leaving home was difficult in the sense that I knew what I was leaving my siblings to. Um, and I hold our culture uh, responsible uh, in its entirety for this kind of tragedy where uh, at school you will not be asked about family life. Family life will not be ranked in its emotional impact, its traumatic impact, what levels of abuse that is carefully masked. No one will ask and no one will tell. And if someone uh, does have the misfortune in our schools to kind of communicate some of their desperation and desolation, they will likely be bullied, humiliated at school by children reenacting the sociopathic ethic of their parents and their culture towards other vulnerable people. Uh, the wound gets internalized and then it gets externalized on those more vulnerable. And so, um, you know, the, the my, my awareness of whether it's the police or the government or the school system or other adults is very much a don't ask, don't tell about family abuse dynamics. Um, no parent typically ever asks, can you explain how I'm hurting you the most as a parent? Because the child actually probably could do it. Um, whether they would do it in a dynamic where every time they mention the abuse of this or that or the other, their parent gets upset and starts shaking. You know, remember that, that parents are giants compared to their children, both psychologically and, and more importantly, physically. You know, so when your, you know, your parents say, oh, tell me what, tell me what, you, I want this, and they get all upset. Well, you watch the, the facial expressions, which don't lie, uh, and you realize uh, they're really saying, uh, uh, please uh, tell me something nice about myself or I will punish you in one way or another. Um, and then more annoyingly than the punishment, deny that it is punishment. No, no, I really want to hear what you're saying. I'm just going to blackmail and humiliate you and glare at you for the next three days for saying it, uh, what I'm so grateful for you to say. And, and, and so there's that irritation as well. Um, and... Uh, you know, a lot, a fair amount of disgust, you know, with, with, with the awareness that my parents were such children that they needed their kids to take care of their feelings, their feelings about hearing how horrible they were as parents. So, there's there's the there's the childishness of, of of not being prepared to have children and having them anyway. Uh, there's the childishness of blaming the child for existing, as opposed to blaming the irresponsibility of the p parent who can't wear a condom or you know whatever. There is the blaming of the child for the parent's feelings. Um, there is the abuse of the child by the parents that can't hold their own feelings. Then there's the blaming of the child for the abuse. Then there's the telling the child that this is not abuse, that this is love, uh, and that this is for your own good and all that bullshit. And then finally, when this just, you know, uh, just pummels the, he the hell 
out of the psyche of the child and they have the audacity to communicate some of the real impact the parent is having on the child, uh, then the parent needs the child to take care of their feelings uh, that they might grasp a tiny bit of the, the incredible incompetence and its impact on the child. And you have the final thing, oh, you're ruining my life, oh, why, we loved you, we did all this for you, etc., etc. et, cetera, et cetera. It's like, you, you're such fucking cowards. You do five levels of abuse, and the final one of, of, of it all is you're too narcissistic to even acknowledge any of it went on, or to allow the possibility that how a giant behaving to a child, um, you know, might might uh, be experienced would be, you know, the a, an objective person would pay more attention to how the child is feeling in relationship to an abusive giant than the giant's feelings uh, about listening to the child communicating how terrified they are of the abuse, um, and. You know, and, and, and every other adult is like, oh, you're, you have such lovely parents and all that. They don't want to ask. They don't want to hear. They want to tell you so that they don't have to deal with it um, and get angry at the child for breaking their little projective illusion. And so, you know, this, this all creates a lot of bitterness and cynicism and anger and rage and stuff because those are the feelings that come out of an incredible imbalance of power with multi-layers of chronic abuse that all keeps being shamed and dumped back on the child as if somehow they are unlovable as opposed to the parent hasn't learned how to love in a cult that doesn't know what the word means and passes on that gibberish, etc., of inter intergenerational abuse from one, from one uh, layer to the next. Um, and so expressing this in my diary and meditation and stuff, dealing with all that is definitely, you know, a, an important um, coping mechanism, um, as was creating, you know, plan A and plan B and plan C of, you know, how to run away from home, how to commit suicide, how to, you know, get out of there as fast as possible, which I did at 17. Um, then, um, with my siblings, my siblings, as many abuse survivors are, are quite loyal to their abusers. And so, in that dynamic, um, I, you know, I found myself in that, you know, very awkward psychological terrain of if I told my siblings any of these thoughts and awarenesses or how they were being abused. Um, there were a couple of things that could go, that would backfire around that. So one is that they might tell my parents, Dane said this and this and this, which then has the parent backlashing towards me. That's, that's one thing in breaking down that, 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 kind of status quo of dissociation from the family. The other is, um, you know, the, the, the siblings being younger, being afraid of being punished, might try and shift the punishment if the parent was angry at them, try and they would know what would upset the parent that I would, say, would have said and how to deflect their punishment towards me. That would be another dynamic. The other dynamic was uh, my siblings were not ready and able and willing to take responsibility for the burden of being a child with incompetent and immature parents. And in that dynamic, uh, they would argue and defend my parents, which was heartbreaking to witness um, because a child isn't ready to deal with the fact that their parents are crazy uh, and <laughs> horrible parents. And I'm not, as I say, as I look at this objectively, I'm not speaking of my parents specifically. I think that we as a culture raise, train, and refuse to educate and pass on intergenerational abuse in a way that creates 
horrible parents. It's not their fault because it's such a dysfunctional culture that who's going to teach them what love is or what being an adult is or that, uh, you know, the manipulation that works so well isn't, you know, very useful or, you know, in, in terms of their child's development or uh, that somehow their child deserves a better childhood than they got um, in the terms of that the child values as opposed to the, the culturally sanctioned terms. We are going to spend more money on you whether you want it or not, and that's good good parenting. Um, but on the child's terms of, you know, I'd like a secure and healthy attachment. I'd, I'd like to be able to tell everything that I'm thinking and feeling without having you squinting and oozing and pounding your fists and, and punishing me to a point where I know that, you know, that no matter what I say that's true, I'll get punished for something. And so I, I clam it all in like I do for the entire rest of the cult which doesn't want to hear it either. Uh, so in those, you know, in those dynamics, I'm not singling my parents out for, for uh, you know, particularly uh, unusual dysfunction. Um, they were more dysfunctional than many parents and less dysfunctional than many parents in different areas. Um, but it is an, an incredibly incompetent system in which parents typically receive no, not even a single formal hour on parenting, uh, on the art of excellent parenting before giving birth, and, and in which the, the, the advice that they're likely to receive may be worse than their own instincts if they do seek it out. Um, and, uh, you know, you can look at the, the, the parenting journals in Adolf Hitler's era, and find things like uh, exuberance must be stomped out in the child. Uh, and the best way to stomp out exuberance is to be erratic in discipline. If your child uh, spills uh, some milk, rage and scream at them. Uh, if they break an expensive vase, just pretend nothing happened. And, Try and confuse your child to such a point of terror that they cease all signs of unhealthy exuberance. Oh, just read the, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the six sociopathic child-rearing manuals of Germany and Hitler's time, and you understand why uh, Hitler, wh why weren't there more Hitlers being raised in this uh, brainwashed and dysfunctional parenting ethic? So it's, 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 it's not a... Uh, you know, it's not a fun thing to look at the profound tragedy of parenting uh, in our culture. Um, but there you have it. And the question is, how do you survive it and, and mitigate that? Now, one of the things that I did was turn my parents into reverse teachers. Um, and so, for example, my father... Uh, never liked to take responsibility and apologize for anything. So I thought that was probably a good thing to do, take responsibility and apologize for things. Um, my mother lied and then lied about lying and then pretended it never happened, which was the worst loneliness. First, you'd be bribed because she didn't know how to parent. Then she wouldn't keep the bribe and thus lie which is both a betrayal of the thing, and then she would lie about that, and then she would just pretend, put it out of mind and pretend that the whole thing never happened. And it was the lying and the insistence that important events in my life didn't happen because they implicated her in some way. It was that lying that meant that my truth didn't get to exist. And it really pissed me off and hurt. It's one of the deepest wounds between uh, Sherilyn and I. And so uh, in that dynamic, in that dynamic, uh, I'm not going to lie. And so I've never lied to a friend or a lover, a partner, etc., a client. I, I don't lie. And, um, and so in that sense, negative teachers. Uh, I hate this about them, so I'm not going to do it. And that came into, you know, later life as well, where I hated their marriage. Um, they made themselves and each other miserable. And 
when you have two parents that make each other miserable and they are the role models, there's not any logical reason to believe that you know what a healthy relationship looks like. And so I decided just to stay out of it. They got married young. I decided I would, wouldn't have a relationship until I was 30. Um, and I'd study it first and, you know, and not end up in this, you know, state of profound incompetence. So, uh, so they were negative teachers. I mean, there, there's certain things that carry through that are positive. You know, my father has a strong articulating or had when he was alive, a strong articulating talent. And uh, in order to win my space, uh, I had to learn to debate with him and to, to a certain extent to follow along his logic to a point where, you know, he's setting the terms as the giant in the space. And so I've got to use his paradigm and his language and his rationale to show that I have a right to exist would be a way to say it. Um, or in his humiliation games to throw some of that humiliation back at him. Um, and so that, that's a positive teaching in the sense that, that I have a strong articulating talent. Um, my mother was an excellent vegetarian cook and that probably played a role in my confidence to develop my own uh, extensive cooking uh, dynamic. Um, and my parents were interested in metaphysics and so I developed an interest in metaphysics only I took it much more seriously than they did um, and really wanted to to avoid the hypocritical dynamic you know that they were were exhibiting. They talked about the environment. I decided I would give money to charity and help the environment and start an ecological business, etc. And so in that sense, taking the best and learning from the opposite of the worst was a way to win in that dynamic. Um, I also, I didn't like moving around at all, uh, you know, from all the time. They moved us around all the time. Um, how to benefit. Well, one of them was to, to notice uh, the different cultural ways of doing things. And more importantly, that, you know, to just learn the lesson that wherever I go, a majority of people think they're right and think very different things than the majority I just left. Um, which leads to the obvious conclusion that uh, most of them are wrong in, in the sense if there's an either or pa paradigm and you travel to five cultures or countries or communities and they all think they're right doing very different things, you realize they're probably all wrong. And that's a very liberating realization for an individual, uh, particularly if they are surrounded by incompetence. But, you know, if you believe that's the way of doing things, then it's like, well, where do you innovate? If you believe that just about anywhere you go, uh, most people are doing most things incompetently relative to the optimal, then you've got a, a, a clear direction inward to say, well, how do I want to do it? How do I want to do an education system? How do I want to do a relationship? Um, I felt very sad for my siblings, and I couldn't deal with my own grief and I couldn't deal with my own grief and deal with them defending my parents. It was just too difficult. Um, one of the things that I've realized as a general source of, of friction in family dynamics is that uh, diseases are contagious. Narcissism is contagious because if you have a narcissistic parent, you feel completely invisible because you are. The narcissistic parent is aware of themselves and referencing themselves, and so you feel incredibly small. Because you feel incredibly small, you compensate to take up a lot of space. But there's still a core part of you that feels no matter how much space I take up, I'm tiny. I don't exist. So I've got to take up more space. But I feel like I don't exist. So I've got to take up more space. Well, now you're a narcissist. Because while you're busy trying to exist and not feel trapped in that feeling of non-existence, 
you're not aware of the fact that you're taking up, uh, you know, 60% of the space in a 100-person room uh, because you're compensating for your feelings that you don't exist because you got that message 10,000 times from these giants that acted that way and you're busily trying to say, no, I exist, I exist. And in that, in that reaction, there's no space for other people. So narcissism is contagious, shame is contagious, violence is, is contagious, um, ignorance is contagious. You know, you, you, you enter an ignorant population that has, hasn't a clue about any number of things. Um, but pretend like their way is the only way to do things and suddenly you're behaving like them. You're fitting in to meet your need for belonging and security and survival in an ignorant culture and suddenly uh, you're just as ignorant as they are. So everything is contagious. And uh, the worst thing about a family is that all of the children catch the diseases in one form or another of the parents to the point that by the time they are an adult, they have internalized many of the diseases of the parent. And for example, one of the bottom line laws in my family system was no one can feel deep feelings with honor. No one can feel deep feelings with honor. Uh, deep feelings will be suppressed and minimized and dishonored and marginalized and rationalized against and told how you're so dumb for feeling them and whatever they are, no matter what, deep feelings cannot be honored. And each of my siblings uh, exhibit this trait in great abundance, which is, of course, the biggest wound. Because if you've grown up with all of the people around you saying that your deep feelings don't matter, and that even if they do, they only matter to be suppressed and rationalized and told why they shouldn't exist, then the thing you need more than anything else is for validation of deep feelings, i.e. the thing I need more than anything else is validation for deep feelings, validation for my rage, validation for my hate, validation for my grief, validation for the trapped child in PTSD, validation for my sadness, validation for my anger at other parents repeating the, the, the same thing that my parents did to me in, in the same denial patterns at the expense of their child. And, you know, appreciation for my love, appreciation for my risk, for my courage, for my affection, for my kindness, my generosity, honor of my deep feelings. That's what I need when that has been deprived since birth. Well, what do each of my siblings give me? They embody that particular family pattern. So all I have to do to feel re-wounded and re-triggered is go into a deep feeling with any of my siblings and watch them ignore it, rationalize against it, tell me I shouldn't be feeling it, no matter what it is, that's the, the rule, no deep feelings in the family. So now they are becoming the persecutors of the family system, having um, you know, internalized the unspoken law that no deep fe feelings can be felt in the, in the family household. And so uh, Dane's breaking that rule, so let's tell him about how his feelings don't matter. Let's just ignore them completely. He mentions uh, he was raped. Uh, let's change the subject because that's leading towards deep feelings. Uh, he mentions he's sad. Uh, let's tell him why he shouldn't be sad uh, and why he, he shouldn't be talking about feelings so much in, in general. And, and so, you know, watching my, my siblings become the puppets, the, the disease carriers of my, my parents, uh, is, is a tragedy in part because of the loneliness, which is another family dynamic. Uh, as part of the loneliness dynamic, you can never acknowledge what's going on because that would be to bring some intimacy. If I acknowledge that I'm tormenting you, then I have to acknowledge that you're experiencing the pain of being tormented, which means that you get to exist, that your feelings are real. Well, that can't happen uh, in, in this dynamic. And so, no, that's not happening. No, let's ignore this. And so the, the sense of invisibility. And it's, it's very sad. Um, however, 
I've, I've, I've learned that with each of my siblings, um, even if I'm trying to be helpful and point out or acknowledge certain patterns in the family system, uh, the fact that it is so sad for me to see them in their present state. Because I knew my siblings when the veil across their spirit was not as opaque as it is today. And each of them were magnificent. And each of them was beautiful. Each of them is beautiful beyond the programming they have been asked to carry. And they've been asked to carry it so that my parents can remain children. And so, you know, wh whether it's dad do clawing around doing this or mom doing this, it's, it's always at the expense of the child. And that's, that's very sad for them. Because they then believe the, the, the message that there's something fundly, fundamentally unlovable and wrong with them. So they're depressed or addictive or, uh, you know, compulsive in this way, in different pain management strategies while defending their abuser. No, they weren't that bad. No, you... Da, da, da. It's, it's just very painful. And then if I turn the attention to myself, every feeling I bring up gets dishonored in the family dynamic. Every feeling I get gets dishonored. Now, if I point it out, I have a four-hour recorded conversation with my sister when I was suicidal. And in four hours of talking with her, in which I got physically sick, she never validated a single one of my feelings. Now, this was going on from the first 30 minutes, and so I started pointing it out. Every 30 minutes, I would say, you still haven't validated a single feeling. Well, then she would have to invalidate all of those observations. No, I wasn't. Do you want to listen to the recording? No, I don't want to do that. I don't want to see the pattern. I want you to disappear like I'm asking myself to disappear so that we can meet our contract with mom and dad not to protect their sensitive feelings by not having any of our own. That's what I'd like. I'd like to make mom and dad comfortable in whatever way is necessary so that they won't hate me, which they do because they hate themselves for not having that emotional regulation and, uh, you know, and, and stuff, so they're blaming it on the child. They can't contain and hold their own feelings, so they shame the children, making them responsible for the feeling. You know, playing the whining babies, oh, your mother. It's always your mother, right? It's not my wife that I chose and fucked without a condom and had children without having parenting skills and then dumped all my hostility. No, no it's your mother. Your mother's doing this. and Your father did this. This endless uh, blaming the child uh, for all of their, their choices and, and stuff while taking credit, of course, for anything that goes, you know, goes right, making the child feel like they're just a piece of shit, um, you know, and then drilling that in and then complaining that they're not more motivated after that. So it's, it's it, you know, it's an absolutely pathological, sick and sociopathic nightmare of a protocol for bringing a spiritual human being into the world uh, to be aware of their potential, their dignity, their grace, and their value. Uh, and so, you know, there you have it. Um, so, so that's, you know, the, the fact that a family carries the, the disease that hurt you the most, because most families don't come to terms with their disease and clear it up, um, you know, if it comes out in the open, the, the parent often begs the child to see it from their perspective. Oh, you had no idea how hard it was at the time. Oh, mom, don't worry. I'll continue to feel like it's all my fault so that you can feel better. Oh, thank you. You're such a good child. Uh, yes, I'm stuck in the child role with, an, with a grown-up uh, child who's pretending to be an adult. How, how, how am I going to really reach my potential and my truth within that framework in which I th see my primary role is not to upset you and you calling that love? So, um, 
I've done constellation work with 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 uh, the, these dynamics. I've looked at family patterns in, in a variety of different ways. Um, the the data points are useful in understanding what's going on inside my psyche to, for example, track my siblings. Uh, every one of my siblings has employed intense pain management strategies of one form or another, including myself. Several of my siblings, including myself, are periodically suicidal. Well, when you understand psychological science, you understand that's not how we were born. Um, there is an intense web of denied pain that in the denial of that pain creates loneliness, which is a further pain, which in a culture of denial and uh, suppression and minimization of deep feelings as well, doesn't get repaired. And so at certain levels, very, very, very rare organisms on the planet commit suicide. But at certain levels of pain, certain rare organisms, tarsier monkeys are, are one of the few, uh, you know, in nature, but human beings, a surprising number, can be induced into a level of pain where they, they would rather die than deal with this, the pathological disease created by their, their own cult, uh, their species, their culture. And, uh, you know, that, that's a, a very rare phenomena in natural history. So, um, I've done work to give back the shame. I've done some work, you know, to kind of give back to my, my mother. I've mo mostly just decided to treat each of my family members as people. And can we connect in a way that creates value in which we be both get to express parts of ourselves that we like? No, I can't do that with you. You interrupt me every five minutes. You argue. You won't let me have feelings. Go do that to someone else. No, you won't return your phone calls. Well, go ignore someone else. No, you have nothing to say. You, you, you have no affect, no feeling. Come, come on, let's engage, engage. Well, I've worked with, with uh, uh, you know, that brother more than most, and the other highly religious and afraid of my ideas, you know, dogmatically fundamentalist Christian and afraid of thinking because uh, Christianity, you know, is, is not the, the, the most... Uh, integrated system of thinking and so there's many ways that thoughts might threaten some pillar of the church and stuff and and so you know he's he's doing you know that type of of uh, defending the church by not thinking or talking with people who think and so well I'm out out for that reason um, and you know and my father punishes people in direct proportion to their intimacy so if you have nothing to do with my father he speaks quite highly of you. you know, the closer you get, the more uh, you're a horrible, miserable person. Um, you know, and, uh, and my mother is emotionally dissociative to a large extent um, and prefers a lot of her own versions of reality to anyone else's felt experience. So, well, that's the opposite of what I'm aiming for. So it just kind of leaves me alone in the family system. Um, and... So then the, the, the focus is on using the, the horrors of the family system to bridge out and find something more like the opposite of the family. So, for example, I've dated older, highly emotional and, and nurturing women to kind of be the opposite of my mothering experience and actually have people who who feel more than I do, and who enjoy their own feelings. It's like wonderful medicine. Um, and, you know, I fly around halfway around the world to uh, find, you know, in, in Thailand and Philippines, far more focus on feelings and on flow and in connection. Now my tears, strangers ask me why I'm crying or this, that, you know, and I realize, oh, I'm in a culture that, that, honors my feelings as opposed to humiliate me for having them. 
Well, that's medicinal. So just kind of this opposite approach. Take the toxicity of my cult and the toxicity of my family and reverse it in a very intentional way. Um, in general, in general, um, you know, the, the, I'm open. And, you know, there have been moments of, of deep flow with, with uh, family to some degree or another. Um, and, in fact, my mother more recently actually began to listen and understand, you know, some of these things in a way that she really hadn't wanted to before. Um, but it, it, there's such a gap between the desire and what's there that it creates pain and pain that doesn't get responded to. Because if I say I'm in pain and I don't like this, it doesn't mean my mother responds and says, oh, let me adapt or respond. She just carries on doing what she does, uh, in a way that leaves me feeling invisible. And so at a certain point, it's just back up uh, because, you know, to try and heal a wound of invisibility with someone who makes me feel invisible with the lack of responsiveness. Kind of like if you're walking into a room and you're standing there and someone just walks right into you, you feel invisible because they're not adjusting their behavior as they see you. They're just doing whatever they're going to do as if you don't exist. And, and so um, there's still some of that dynamic where my feelings can escalate rapidly if I'm engaging with a family member as they reenact certain family patterns. And then I communicate that there is escalation and there's no response. And so it escalates higher and it's just like a blowout, like I've got a disconnect from you because I'm not going to shut down my feelings just because you're committed to avoiding them. And I'm not going to just keep escalating my feelings because you're ignoring and marginalizing them. So I'm going to state what's going on and pull back and create some kind of framework. Um, and that, uh, you know, that, that creates a certain amount of space, um, but it, it, it is also a wound in and of itself because the desire is to have, you know, a full sense of family without having to violate the connection with my body and with my feelings. That's not available to me. That's a desire that is not available, so it is a source of pain. Um, and, uh, and so I channel that, you know, that pain in, in more intense energy at consciously creating that with other people that are able and willing to do that. Mm -hmm.